Rapacious colonial violence goes hand in hand with racist thinking, and this one-two punch presents a challenge to 21st century readers of Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness. Some critics have wondered whether such a novel is worth reading today. But certainly there's social merit to art that makes us think critically about history and loathsome systems. We shouldn't ignore the blatant racism of this novella. Likewise, we shouldn't let such language and ideas obscure the indictment of Belgian colonial rule in the Congo Free State. Joseph Conrad was born in Ukraine on December 3rd, 1857. His parents were Polish nobility who conspired against the Russian rule of their homeland, which after a long history of independence had been divided among the Russian, Austrian, and Prussian empires. They were arrested and exiled to northern Russia when Conrad was four years old, and both of them died before he turned 13. Conrad thus experienced political oppression early on, and it instilled in him a sense of the mixed nature of human beings, with the capacity for both good and evil. Conrad became a sailor, and his service as a deckhand on a British freighter brought him to England in 1878, where he would continue to live until his death on August 3rd, 1924. In 1890, he spent six months traveling up the Congo River. He started writing full-time in 1894, and in 1899, Heart of Darkness was published to moderate critical praise. His writing, however, brought attention to Belgium's barbarous colonial control and exploitation of Central Africa. In 1903, a British consul solicited Conrad's support in exposing these atrocities to the public. Belgian colonization of the Congo and the ivory trade. In the late 1800s, many European countries began seizing parts of the African continent, creating artificial boundaries and colonies they claimed as part of their empires. In the 1870s, King Leopold II of Belgium led a group of investors to form a trading company to control trade along the Congo River. Leopold used trade agreements with indigenous groups as the pretext for claiming authority over much of Central Africa. He ran the colony as his personal property, separate from the Belgian government, and this was codified in the Berlin-West Africa Conference of 1884 and 1885, which recognized existence of the Congo Free State under Leopold's personal control. His rule of the Congo was particularly harsh on the people and the environment, even by colonial standards. Belgians enslaved the indigenous people of the Congo and forced them to strip resources, using torture, mutilation, and murder to enforce quotas. From 1888 to 1890 alone, 140 tons of ivory were exported from the Congo Free State. As a direct result of the Belgian barbarity, at least 10 million Congolese people died between 1880 and 1920, reducing the population by half. The Congo won independence in 1960. The present Democratic Republic of the Congo occupies the same area that was once the Congo Free State. Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness is set in the 1890s at the height of European colonization of the African continent. In the introduction, five friends sit on a yacht waiting for the tide to change on the River Thames so they can head out to sea. Marlowe, the storyteller of the group, begins a tale by saying, and England also has been one of the dark places of the earth. His words set the dark, brooding tone of the novella. He tells his friends he once signed on to pilot a boat upriver in Africa. Marlowe explains that he undertook the trip while working for a European ivory extraction operation known simply as The Company. The Company hired Marlowe in Europe and gave him the task of picking up one of its agents in Africa, a man named Kurtz, to relieve him of his duty. Apparently, Kurtz employed questionable methods for consistently collecting more ivory than any of the other company stations. With this goal in mind, Marlowe travels to Africa. He disembarks at the coastal outer station and then travels 200 miles to the company's central station, where the river is navigable and his steamer is supposed to be waiting for him. Once there, Marlowe learns that his steamer is sunk at the bottom of the river. He meets the central station manager, who tells him that the situation is very grave at the inner station, where Kurtz is the agent and where Marlowe is meant to pilot the steamer. Marlowe's told it will take three months to repair the boat, and he concludes that the delays are intentional, Kurtz is ill, and the manager hopes he'll die before Marlowe reaches him. Marlowe overhears a conversation between the station manager and his uncle. The two exchange dark hints about Kurtz's character and behavior. 
Eventually, the boat is repaired, and along with the manager and pilgrims and 20 cannibals, Marlowe heads upriver. Eight miles from the inner station, the steamer is attacked by natives. Marlowe's helmsman is killed. Marlowe pitches the body overboard to avoid having it eaten by the native crew members. When they eventually meet, Kurtz tells Marlowe some of his ideas. Marlowe has read Kurtz's report, arguing that godlike whites can bring civilization to Africa. Marlowe thinks Kurtz has gone mad. Arriving at Central Station, Marlowe meets a Russian dressed in colorful, patchworked clothes that make him look like a harlequin. The Russian tells Marlowe that Kurtz often spends long periods in the jungle, staying with the native people or gathering ivory. He suggests Kurtz uses extreme methods to secure the ivory, and he says the native people adore him. Marlowe observes fence posts with severed human heads on them. When Kurtz arrives, he's on a stretcher, very ill. With mixed feelings about Kurtz, Marlowe agrees to protect his papers and his reputation once Marlowe returns to Europe. Kurtz dies on the trip downriver. The last thing Marlowe hears him say is, the horror, the horror. Marlowe delivers Kurtz's report to a journalist for publication and his papers to the fiancé Kurtz left behind in Europe. We come to the end of Marlowe's tale and the action returns to the five friends on the yacht. The Thames is flowing under an overcast sky into the heart of an immense darkness. There are many symbols in Heart of Darkness. They include darkness, both the literal darkness in the jungle and the waters of the river, as well as the metaphoric darkness in the hearts of the company agents. Ivory. Ivory symbolizes the greed and corruption of the Europeans, consuming their every passion and desire and luring them to Africa. Harlequin. The Russian's presence, resembling a harlequin, emphasizes the absurdity of the situation and suggests another literary convention, the wise fool, although the Russian seems more naive than wise. Drums. For Marlowe, the drums are the sound equivalent of the jungle. They represent the unnerving vitality of native life. Dark wool. The knitting of dark wool by two women at the company office in Brussels reinforces the symbol of darkness in the novella. The women are the knitters of funeral shrouds used in death, the ultimate darkness. The themes in Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness include racism. Heart of Darkness reflects the racism of the time, and racism becomes a primary aspect of the novella. Greed and imperialism. The company says it wants to civilize the native people, but the true goal is to gain power and money. This attitude is the essence of imperialism. Everything belongs to the power that can take it. Hypocrisy and indifference. The company is recalling Kurtz, apparently because they find his methods to be excessively brutal. Yet company officials overlook their own brutality in pursuit of ivory. Civilization and barbarism. Though believing they come from a more civilized culture, the agents of the company consistently behave in a more barbaric manner than the so-called savages of uncivilized Africa. Critical reception of Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness has ranged from Chinua Achebe's label of Conrad as a bloody racist, to the lofty elevation as one of the greatest short novels of the 20th century. In between such polarized views, we can find a nuanced appreciation for this novella, there's room to track Marlowe's virulent condemnation of colonial violence while also noting the novella's foundation in Western racist thinking. <laughs>